Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and wherever you are in the world, welcome to another um, webinar of the Monetary Policy Institute. This one kicks off 2024, and we have um, a fantastic presentation ahead by Eckert Hein on inflation, followed by comments by Stephanie Kelton. Um, so before we begin, let me introduce our guest today, Eckert Hein, since 2009. He has been the professor of economics at the Berlin School of Economics and Law. He is the managing co-editor of the European Journal of Economics and Economic Policies Intervention. He sits on various editorial boards of journals, including the Review of Political Economy. And he is the author of numerous articles and books, including his latest one from Edward Elgar, uh, Macroeconomics after Kiletsky and Keynes. Uh, welcome, Eckert. And if you want to share your slides, uh, please do so now. Yeah, many thanks, uh, Louis Philippe, for organizing this. Many thanks for all the colleagues who are here. And of course, many thanks for, to Stephanie for uh, being available as a discussant. Um, I understand that I can speak uh, 45 minutes and uh, what I want to try to do uh, started out as a, a presentation at the last FMM conference uh, in Berlin when I was asked to give one of the plenary talks on, uh, well, as you see here, on inflation uh, from a post Keynes perspective and uh, also address uh, the current uh, or the recent uh, increase in inflation associated with redistribution uh, tendencies. Um, now, the title I chose is uh, meant to be a bit provocative, uh, provocative and, uh, uh, and, and it, it therefore tries to uh, explain how post Keynesians in general see inflation. Um, starting point is uh, the well-known empirical studies, uh, which uh, I think you are all aware with, uh, who have observed in many countries uh, a simultaneous rise in inflation uh, and an increase in profits or the profit shares in the course of uh, the COVID crisis and then the war in Ukraine. Uh, Weber and Wasner, uh, most prominently, I think, have called this then seller's inflation. Others have talked about profit-driven uh, inflation um, as opposed to mainstream uh, assessments of inflation being uh, driven by uh, excess money supply um, or excess aggregate demand. Underlying causes are manifold, so uh, higher import prices, higher energy prices, bottlenecks uh, due to disruptions in global value chains, um, higher markup to firms, uh, lower labor force participation due, during, uh, due to COVID, uh, changes in the structure of demand, etc. Now, the question I'm asking here is what is the relationship with post Keynesian theory of inflation? And uh, to start with some uh, clarifications at the beginning, uh, the point I want to make is that uh, from uh, my reading of post Keynesian theory, my understanding of uh, post Keynesian th theory, uh, inflation uh, requires uh, inconsistent claims of the main groups of actors uh, and may be triggered by any increase in these claims. Um, so in this sense, inflation is always and everywhere a conflict phenomenon, as I claim, uh, and it may be driven by an increase in the rentiers and firms claims, and we will talk about profit-driven conflict inflation, uh, and uh, at the background may be uh, an increase in uh, aggregate demand, uh, allowing firms to raise prices, uh, and uh, desire to increase uh, retained profits, uh, or also uh, increasing interest rates or increasing dividend claims uh, of, of shareholders. Uh, we may have uh, wage-driven conflict inflation um, triggered by increasing uh, workers' claims. We may also have uh, tax-driven conflict inflation uh, triggered by or driven by increasing uh, claims of the government, uh, or uh, we may have external cost or import price-driven conflict inflation triggered by uh, increasing claims of the external sector. Uh, in this sense, I would always, I would argue that inflation is always and everywhere a conflict phenomenon, 
And these distinctions, which we've seen and also in the post Keynesian literature between demand pull or cost push or imported inflation uh, can only relate to the trigger, uh, but not to the essence of inflation. Uh, in uh, the paper, which I'm going to present, I will provide an overview over the development of post Keynesian theory of inflation. And I will broadly distinguish uh, two broad strands. So the first strand, which goes back to Keynes and then includes Caldor, Robinson and uh, Maglin in the early 1980s. A second strand, which I relate to Koletsky and then to the works of Rothorn and Dutt in the 1970s and 1980s, and which uh, I will then discuss a bit more in detail related to the two uh, textbook versions, which we currently find one um, in the Black and Satterfield approach and uh, in uh, Mark Galois' book, and the other one, which goes back to my work with Engelbert Stockhammer. And finally, I will then apply the latter approach to give a, a kind of stylized interpretation uh, of what we've seen in the recent years. Um, now, if we go back to Keynes uh, or to the first approach, uh, you are probably all aware that Keynes in his treatise on money uh, had a distinguished income inflation, uh, which he uh, considers to be uh, related to changes in the rate of what he calls efficiency earnings, so unit labor costs or unit normal profits, and uh, profit inflation, uh, which uh, is due to or caused by excess demand uh, in the goods market, which Keynes in, the nine, in his book in uh, 1930 still relates to a deviation of the money rate of interest from the Vixalian equilibrium real rate of interest. In the general theory, uh, we also find a similar distinction between uh, what he calls semi-inflation, um, which is due to uh, discont discontinuous increases in the wage unit, uh, even below full employment, and then absolute or true inflation, which is uh, triggered or given by increases in effective demand uh, at full employment. However, Keynes um, does not, at least uh, not systematically, discuss the interrelationship uh, between these two types of inflation. We find that then in the later work by um, Caldor and Robinson in the first generation of post Keynesian growth theory, uh, in which, um, as you uh, might remember, um, uh, in the long run, uh, the adjustment of saving to investment takes place via flexible prices. Uh, under the condition that we have a normal utilization of the capital stock and capital we also have full employment uh, and flexible prices is then an equilibrium adjustment processes. Inflation as a continuous rise in the price level will only arise if there is some resistance uh, in this process, some resistance uh, as Caldor 1959 explained uh, by workers, for instance, defending uh, a certain real wage rate or a certain wage share. Uh, Robinson has famously uh, phrased this uh, in, in the context of uh, what she called the inflation barrier. So the real resistance of workers. We have already earlier work on that by Robinson when she explains the um, um, uh, uh, German inflation of the 1920s, uh, uh, which she considers to be uh, triggered by currency devaluation, uh, which then meets real wage resistant and leads to an, uh, a devaluation induced price wage price spiral. Uh, Caldor 59 has uh, the idea of a profit wage price spiral um, um, uh, uh, triggered or driven by workers' desire to share in rising profits. Uh, in uh, the 1970s, 76, Caldor uh, talks about an imported commodity price uh, price wage spiral, so in which uh, import prices uh, trigger uh, the inflationary process. Now, a way to present that, uh, which you which I have in the paper, is a standard presentation of the Caldor Robinson model, in which on the right hand side, I hope you can see my uh, 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 pointer here. On the right hand side, we have uh, investment and saving. On the left hand side, we have uh, the, uh, the wage share and the rate of profit, uh, and uh, in which uh, the equilibrium is given by the point of intersection here on the right hand side. However, this would then mean uh, a uh, wage share lower than the workers' target. Uh, and we therefore have this uh, process of uh, a, a price wage price spiral. So excess demand uh, will uh, trigger inflation 
um, indicating uh, a, a higher uh, uh, profit claim or profit rate claim in this case of the firms, uh, but workers will resist and we will then see this price, uh, price wage price spiral, which is fed by, um, by excess demand in the goods market uh, and by real wage resistance in the labor market. So we will see this rising curve at the bottom. Uh, Marlin 84 has um, has uh, tried to um, um, uh, I see something here on my slides. Maybe I can. Oops, okay, Marlin 84 has uh, then provided a model which um, derives some sort of equilibrium inflation. Uh, in his model, uh, we he tries to synthesize the conflict part. Uh, with the um, aggregate demand part. Um, and uh, he argues that under the condition that uh, wage and price inflation, as you see in, uh, at, the uh, at the bottom of this uh, figure, uh, that wage and price inflation uh, is positively related to the distance of the respective target from the actual uh, uh, rate of profit in this case, we uh, may then see some equilibrium um, in which the price and wage uh, price uh, inflation is equal to wage inflation, and in which none of the two groups, uh, neither the workers nor the firms, uh, uh, reach their target, uh, and we will see equilibrium inflation and equilibrium distribution under this condition. Um, oops, why does this not work? Um, okay. Um, Harcourt, uh, in his, his uh, book on uh, post-Keynesian economics or the, the Cambridge post-Keynesian school, has an application of this model to the um, uh, energy price increases in the 1970s. Uh, and uh, what he argues is that uh, this uh, leads or has led to a decline in animal spirits, so a leftward shift of the accumulation function, which you see here. And it has led to an increase in the target wage share of workers in terms of the domestic income, because now uh, import, uh, import prices rises and workers want to make up for that. And uh, so we see uh, a, a, um, a downward shift of the target wage share of, uh, sorry, the target rate of profit of the workers, uh, and also downward shift of the target rate uh, of profits of the firms given by the new point of intersection uh, in the goods market. And what we see as a result is then uh, a uh, decline in equilibrium uh, accumulation and equilibrium uh, growth uh, and a rise in inflation uh, in this case. Um, and we see a lower profit rate. Uh, this is only one uh, uh, possible outcome. Of course, you may also have uh, usually uh, recessionary, so that was that what I've described so far is the stagflation outcome. You may also have uh, that uh, you, we have a recession uh, associated with a fall in inflation. Um, the problems with this approach, uh, as uh, has been criticized by Amitabha Dutt, to whom I come in the next step, is that uh, in this model we assume permanent uh, normal utilization of the uh, at least the capital stock. Um, Increases in workers' targets in this model uh, is always contractionary, so wage-led demand and wage-led growth are uh, uh, impossible. Uh, an increase in energy prices uh, has no direct effect on the firm's target profit share or the target profit rate, and the indirect effects, as you see here, are negative. Uh, Therefore, uh, rising energy prices and rising uh, and a rising profit rate or a rising profit share, as we've observed recently, are impossible. Furthermore, inflation expectations are not explicitly included. Um, let me therefore come to the uh, second strand in post-Keynesian uh, conflict inflation theory, which goes back to Caldor and has then been formulated by Rothorn and Dutt and is now present uh, in the modern textbook. The basic framework in Koletsky, I think, is uh, uh, well familiar to the audience. Uh, just uh, to recap, so in Koletsky, we have the idea that we only have flexible prices in the primary sector of our economy while in the uh, industry and service se sector we have markup pricing 
um, uh, changes in demand will uh, uh, trigger changes in capacity utilization, which is considered to be endogenous beyond the short run. Markup in Koletsky is determined by uh, price or by the degree of price competition, but also by overhead costs and by, by the bargaining power of trade units. Um, the profit share, including overheads in this model, is then determined by the markup, but also by uh, uh, the ratio of uh, unit raw material cost to unit direct labor cost, and also by the sectoral composition of the economy, because uh, markups may not be the same uh, in each sector. Uh, uh, and also, of course, the te uh, uh, technology of production is not the same in each sector. Uh, in the open economy, this means that uh, if we assume a very simple model uh, for an economy which um, uh, imports raw materials uh, and outputs compete in international markets, we then have that domestic distribution depends on the one hand on the markup, but also uh, on this ratio between uh, imported raw material cost and wage cost, and therefore the normal exchange rate foreign price inflation and domestic inflation can each affect income distribution. Uh, so in other words, a real dev devaluation of uh, the domestic currency may then raise the domestic profit share even if the markup is constant. Um, Koletsky uh, in uh, uh, his um, class struggle and distribution of, of national income uh, is always also quite quite explicit on that uh, increases in money wages will not only affect prices, um, but will also uh, be able to change uh, distribution via the markup. Um, Sulus Labini in, in 79 has, I think, in a very nice paper, um, uh, explained the, uh, let's say, conditions, the microeconomic conditions for that. And the main condition is that we have heterogeneity uh, in the firm sector, uh, so that firms are different uh, and they are competing uh, in markets in which uh, some equilibrium price is uh, being established. And that then means that if firms have different uh, efficiency, different productivity, or different growth of efficiency and different growth in productivity, uh, only the most uh, efficient, the most productive firm will be able to uh, shift um, any increase in wages, in normal wages to prices, while the uh, less productive firms will not be able to do so. And that is a mechanism through which wages or wage increases can affect the markup and can affect income distribution. Um, of course, uh, if we have a fall in normal wage growth, it might work in the opposite direction. Now, if we look at the uh, uh, Koletskian theories of uh, distribution conflict inflation, we I would well, I would like to distinguish uh, two strands, and they are based on each of these uh, papers, which are frequently quoted in the literature. So, on the one hand, the Rothborn uh, paper; on the other hand, the Duck paper. Uh, and if you take a close look at them, they are not the same. Um, in Rothorn, we have the idea that inconsistent targets of workers and firms may lead to unanticipated inflation. And he derives, uh, from uh, starting from this, uh, this view, he derives a Phillips curve for unanticipated inflation, which means that the usual Phillips curve is shifting upwards. He also has this incomplete pass-through of wage inflation to price inflation, and therefore, uh, wage inflation may have an impact on income distribution. In the later part of the paper, he then distinguishes two regimes. Uh, so a low inflation regime in which inflation uh, expectations are uh, do not feed into wage inflation. And only under this condition, uh, he can derive the usual Phillips curve for unemployed unemployment and inflation. While in a high inflation regime, um, uh, we will see a compens uh, high compensator compensatory wage inflation, and therefore uh, unanticipated inflation will be positive and inflation will accelerate. So in this case, we will have this shifting Phillips curve um, um, uh, uh, in his, his approach. Uh, Dunt 87, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, uh, criticized Marlin, uh, so the Marlin approach, uh, in, in, in Marvin's paper, but also in Marvin's book, 
uh, for assuming or for, uh, for excluding uh, the uh, uh, below full capacity uh, case um, and uh, for excluding the possibility of wage flat uh, growth. Um, if we allow for that, or if that allows for that, then uh, he, he shows that inconsistent targets uh, generate inflation in the usual way um, and have an impact on equilibrium distribution. Uh, and uh, depending on uh, um, uh, uh, changes in power relationships, we may then have a stable uh, usual Phillips curve, but we may also see the opposite uh, of a Phillips curve. Uh, an increase uh, in economic activity and a fall in inflation. Uh, in that, uh, we don't have the inclusion of inflation expectations. Now, based on these two papers, I would argue we have uh, two strands uh, of uh, um, uh, conflict inflation uh, models uh, in the post-Keynesian literature. So the first strand, uh, which then uh, can be found or is, is included in the textbooks by uh, Robert Blacker, Mark Setterfield, and Mark Lavoie, uh, can be found in a couple of papers, and I've, uh, I've listed some names here. Um, uh, and what we have, or what is characteristic of this approach, is that uh, it, it, we have uh, in the uh, weight inflation um, uh, equation, we have no or incomplete effects of past inflation. Uh, this is called uh, in Lavoie, for instance, the indexation um, uh, component. And this is either non-existent or it is incomplete. Uh, and for the price inflation equation, we have also no or incomplete pass-through of current uh, wage inflation. Under these conditions, and I will show you a simple a graphical um, a presentation of the model on the next slide, uh, we have that inconsistent claims generate a constant inflation or constant deflation uh, and, cons and constant uh, distribution at any rate of employment. So we don't have the Robinsonian inflation barrier here anymore. Uh, if we have consistent claims, we will get zero inflation. Uh, the other uh, tradition, the other strand goes back to Rothorn and Engelbert Stockham and myself have uh, some 15 years ago starting to started uh, to uh, build some simple teachable uh, uh, models on that and I've included that also in my, my recent book um, and it can be found in some some uh, more uh, elaborated models by Resty Sawyer by Stockham and myself also by Lavoie um, and others. Uh, what is characteristic of this approach is that we have adaptive expectations um, in uh, the workers' wage inflation equation, and then uh, either complete or incomplete pass-through of wage inflation uh, in price inflation. In this approach, uh, inconsistent claims generate uh, unexpected uh, inflation or disinflation, and changes in distribution uh, at any rate of employment uh, deviating from the inflation barrier which is similar to uh, the Nairo in uh, uh, orthodox economics. Uh, I prefer to call this the stable inflation rate uh, of employment. But uh, as Engelbert Starkhammer 2008 has pointed out, um, in this approach, there is a Nairo at any point in time, but this Nairo is neither exogenous nor is it a, a, a strong attractor for actual unemployment, as also Markham Sawyer in several papers has, has, has stressed. Um, uh, only consistent claims in this model generate constant uh, inflation and constant income distribution. Uh, and this consist uh, consistent claims equilibrium, so the sire in my, uh, my terminology, is endogenous to aggregate demand and also the economic policies through a lot of channels. So through endogenous aspirations, uh, labor market persistence, uh, capital, we have capital stock effects, real interest rate effects, tax rate effects. Uh, real exchange rate effects, um, uh, etc. Um, now, oops. So this is a simple way of trying to present this approach. So again, we have uh, the targets on the right hand, upper right hand side of uh, our our presentation. So the target wage share of firms, the target wage share of workers, which is rising. Uh, then we have the actual uh, wage share, which is uh, in between the two targets, 
uh, we have an uh, employment curve, which is assumed to be uh, wage land. So we assume wage land demand. Um, and uh, well, as I already mentioned, uh, the actual uh, wage share is a profit, has a, a profit squeeze characteristics. Uh, here we have the uh, respective uh, price and wage inflation and down here as well. And what you get is then an equilibrium uh, if uh, your employment uh, curve uh, intersects with the distribution curve uh, uh, with positive and constant inflation. And this also determines uh, your income distribution and equilibrium. Um, the problem which I see with this approach uh, and uh, is that um, if workers have a target which exceeds their uh, previous wage share, and they are now in the current period, um, since they are strong, have control over normal wage growth, I don't see why they would not fully include the expected rate of price inflation into their wage inflation. A similar argument could be made for price inflation. So if firms are strong and if they have a, a target um, of uh, uh, a target wage share, which is below uh, the past period wage share, why should they not fully include current wage inflation into price inflation? So this is why, why I prefer, as you might uh, not be surprised, the approach which Starkhammer and I have uh, put forward, uh, in which uh, we have uh, a wage inflation uh, equation in which um, we have uh, adaptive expectations and past inflation is fully included into wage inflation if workers are strong and the employment rate exceeds the stable inflation rate of employment, so the side. Uh, for price inflation, uh, if we then plug that in uh, into the price inflation equation and rearrange that a bit, we get that price inflation is affected by a previous inflation, so taken from there, and uh, uh, relying on the Sulos Nabini argument, uh, we have that uh, only the most efficient firms, the most productive firms are fully able uh, to shift uh, wage inflation to price inflation, while um, less eff effective, less efficient, less productive firms may not be able to do so. Therefore, we may see in the aggregate that uh, this excess wage inflation is only partially shifted to price inflation. Based on that, we then get that um, uh, uh, if we are looking at a, at, a, at a situation in which workers are strong, so employment is exceeding the stable inflation rate of employment, we have that wage inflation will exceed price inflation. And therefore, uh, we have, um, uh, we have, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, we have that excess wage inflation, so the difference between wage inflation and previous price inflation, and unexpected inflation, so the difference between current inflation uh, and previous price inflation, we have that um, uh, excess wage inflation will exceed excess price inflation or unexpected price inflation, which means that we uh, neither have a stable Phillips curve, nor do we have a stable distribution curve. So, um, um, uh, our traditional Phillips curve would be shifting upwards, wage inflation would always uh, uh, exceed price inflation, and the distribution curve would rotate uh, towards the worker's target, which means that what you have here as E1 is not an equilibrium. It's a temporary position uh, which uh, gets further shifted outwards. So in other words, we get an unstable process which uh, takes us further away from uh, our distribution equilibrium, from our sire. Um, in this sense, uh, this sire or the Nairu uh, is not as strong a structure as Malcolm Sawyer 2002 had already pointed out. Um, oops. Of course, you may want to compare these two approaches a bit more in detail uh, and also look at how one can uh, maybe uh, 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 or how minor changes in one of the approaches leads us closer to the other one. Uh, those of you who are interested in that, we have a companion working paper uh, which has just come out in which we are trying to do that. And we built uh, in total eight models uh, with uh, different results depending on the way we're modeling 
uh, targets and depending on the way we are modeling uh, the um, uh, 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 role of uh, uh, expectation or indexation in the respective equations. But this is not um, what I want to do here. Uh, I want to use the remaining 15 minutes or so to apply the latter approach, so the approach which uh, uh, goes back to my work with uh, Engelbert Stockhammer, in a more uh, qualitative way uh, to what we have observed uh, in the recent past. Um, and I will do that in a four-step uh, approach. Um, the first step being an increase in imported energy prices. And since I will look uh, at an economy, at an open economy, which mainly imports energy, this is equivalent uh, to uh, a change uh, in the real exchange rate. Uh, then in the second step, uh, firms take advantage of uh, supply constraints uh, and may increase markups. Um, in the third step, we will then follow the effects of inflation targeting uh, central bank banks, which drive up long-term interest rates in order to reduce uh, inflation. And in the fourth step, I will sketch a post-Keynesian alternative uh, to uh, uh, inflation targeting central bank policies. Now, this is uh, the first step. I hope you can see the figure. I've tried to play with colors and with uh, broken lines instead of solid lines. So what we assume here is, a, is an open economy uh, in which uh, we uh, are importing uh, uh, energy. Um, the workers don't consume imported goods. So the if initial effect is only on, on the firms. Um, and uh, we then uh, look uh, at uh, the outcome of uh, an increase in uh, imported energy. Um, so what we see is, or what we will see, is uh, um, a, a downward shift of the firm's uh, target wage share curve. Um, we will see uh, a... Uh, lower uh, profit squeeze uh, distribution curve. That's what you see here. Um, the wage land employment curve may either stay where it is or it may, may even shift to the right because uh, we have improved uh, price competitiveness uh, of domestic producers uh, with regard to the rest of the world. And as a result, we will see an upward shift in the unexpected uh, inflation uh, Phillips curve. Um, in the new temporary position uh, with the index two, you will then see uh, unexpected inflation. You will see uh, a lower equilibrium wage share, and you will also see uh, lower employment. If nothing else happens in this simple model, um, we would now also see tendencies which bring us back to the initial equilibrium, which I don't show here for the reason that these tendencies uh, due to the following steps did not become effective uh, because unexpected inflation uh, at E1 would now, of course, lower uh, the real exchange rate. Uh, by means of that, it would increase the firm's target uh, weight share again. So this curve would shift up again. Um, and therefore, it would increase uh, the uh, sire and move it back towards the initial um, equilibrium employment or distribution uh, equilibrium employment rate. Um, the effect on the employment curve is, 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 is not clear because on the one hand, since uh, we now have um, um, uh, uh, unexpected inflation, so uh, the employment curve could be shifted to the right because of um, uh, real debt effects on, uh, um, on, on aggregate demand. Uh, but we on, also have to consider, or would have to consider uh, uh, open economy effects or net export effects of a falling a real exchange rate. But this did, uh, this did not become effective because in the next step, we then and now look, please look at the greed lines. We now include uh, the uh, increase in firms markups um, uh, 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 as pointed out, for instance, by, by Weber and Vasner and by others. Um, but before I move there, I should probably stay here for a second. Um, now, what you see here as a new temporary position, uh, and uh, this has been discussed um, in the post-Keynesian debate, 
more on the blogs, uh, but now we also have some papers on that. What you see here is that uh, we have a fall in the wage share and an increase in the profit share uh, without firms um, changing their pricing behavior, so without firms raising markups. So in this case, um, uh, the uh, change in imported raw materials is sufficient uh, to raise uh, uh, profit shares and to lower uh, wage shares. So we don't need for this result an increase in markups. However, to the extent that we have these increases, and now I'm, uh, I'm here with the green lines, uh, we see um, further changes in our model. Uh, we would now see um, a, um, uh, a further downward shift of the firm's target weight share, so from the red to the green line. Um, the profit uh, squeeze distribution uh, uh, um, uh, uh, curve would also shift down um, to the uh, green line. Um, the wage-led uh, employment curve would shift to the left because we have uh, loss of international price competitiveness. Um, and the unexpected inflation Phillips curve would shift up. So this effect would lead uh, us to a even lower equilibrium wage share. It would lead us to a lower um, uh, employment rate. It would lead to a lower uh, um, uh, sire, a lower stable inflation rate of employment, and it leads to higher unexpected inflation. Again, if uh, nothing else happens, we would again see in uh, the context of this model uh, through uh, the uh, unexpected inflation channel and through the uh, um, a, 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 a associated uh, lowering of the real exchange rate, we would see tendencies to move uh, towards uh, moving back to the initial equilibrium. Um, <clears throat> um, um, uh, uh, but again, these uh, tendencies don't become effective because in the next step, we now have uh, um, inflation targeting monetary policies. We now see um, a, uh, an increase in, uh, uh, in interest rates, uh, leading also to increases in long-term interest rates, and including this increase has now two effects in the model. Uh, one effect is on the employment curve or on the demand curve, which gets shifted to the right under the conditions that we have some normal case effects of higher interest rates on aggregate demand. But we also have to consider an interest cost effect um, on a, a firm's um, target uh, markup, because uh, if uh, interest costs are rising, uh, the markup of firms over a unit uh, wage cost and unit material cost will have to rise as well in order to cover higher uh, interest costs. And therefore, uh, this channel, this interest cost channel, would lead us uh, would lead to a fall uh, in the target weight share curve of firms, uh, and it would lead uh, in the lower part of the figure to an upward rise of our uh, unexpected uh, inflation curve. Mm. Now, of course, it depends on how strong each of these effects are, and what you see here is just one possible outcome. Uh, a possible outcome can be that, uh, on the one hand, our stable inflation rate of employment becomes even lower now. And then, depending on the strength of the effect of an increase in the interest rate on the employment curve, uh, we will see, uh, we can see an employment rate which still exceeds the stable inflation employment rate, uh, but uh, we would now see lower unexpected inflation. Um, we would see a lower, uh, lower wage share, um, but inflation would still tend to rise, uh, inducing central banks uh, to raise interest rates even further in order to constrain the economy even further. And the conditions for uh, um, uh, stabilizing inflation rates or bringing inflation rates uh, back to some target rate uh, would of course be that uh, the effect on the uh, on aggregate demand on the employment curve would have to shift uh, the uh, employment rate below uh, the new stable 
uh, inflation rate of employment. So in other words, uh, this kind of policies is uh, a uh, well a road towards a stagflation, a road towards the central banks constraining the economy without being able to um, uh, permanently uh, uh, bringing inflation down. Um, at least uh, we have to look, uh, 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 always have to look at the effect of this interest cost channel. Now, what is the alternative policy approach? And now apologies for this uh, rather, uh, um, uh, for this figure, which may look a bit uh, weird, but what I'm trying to do here is to, um, um, in, in one figure, and now the red uh, lines are, are important and are of relevance. What I try to show here is uh, the effect of a policy approach which uh, we have elaborated with Engelbert Stockhammer, but not only we, but many others have elaborated on, uh, which uh, takes seriously the, um, um, the source of inflation, and the source of inflation is distribution conflict, um, and tries to uh, cope uh, uh, with this source uh, of inflation and tries to moderate uh, the inflationary pressure. Uh, in this case, uh, we have an increase in energy prices, an increase in uh, imported energy costs, uh, which means that now everything else constant, there is less real income available for the domestic economy. So we need a policy approach which shares the burden in terms of income distribution. Now, sharing the burden means that we have to align a, a target, we, we have to align wage share targets uh, of firms uh, uh, and of workers. Second, we have to make sure that uh, the um, uh, wage share, or we have to uh, push firms for going for lower profit share and therefore for higher wage share targets. Um, so this, this would mean that um, we uh, um, would have to induce firms target wage share to return to the initial equilibrium by lowering the aggregate markup uh, according to the rise uh, in energy prices. So in other words, just to shift uh, or, 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 or yeah, pass through the increase in energy prices, but not marking up this part of variable cost increases. Um, Central bank policies lowering interest rates could assist that because it would mean that uh, we are lowering interest costs for firms, um, but also intervening into uh, the goods markets by means of price caps, uh, by means of competition policies, and by means of uh, bottlenecks, uh, of, of reducing bottlenecks, um, uh, increasing public investment, for instance, could contribute to that in the long run. Workers' targets would have to be aligned with what is available by firms pricing. Uh, and uh, so we would have to make the workers' target wage share, at least in a relevant uh, um, uh, uh, range, uh, equal to what is available uh, given by pricing of firms. Um, and uh, to make sure that our stable inflation rates now become stable inflation rate of employment, our SIRE becomes a corridor, a corridor between EN5 uh, uh, low and EN5 uh, uh, high, uh, which you see here, which means that any demand trigger change in employment will now not lead to changes uh, in wage uh, and price inflation. For that, uh, the literature tells us that uh, wage bargaining coordination uh, would be uh, the uh, uh, appropriate institutional condition um, that would allow us for following the wage norm uh, in the medium to long run, uh, which means that normal wages should rise at target rate at, at the target rate of inflation plus some trend productivity growth for the economy as a whole. The target rate of inflation should be in line with the inflation rate of the main trading partners to prevent uh, bank of our neighbor policies. So international coordination would be uh, would be important. Um, fiscal uh, policy demand management, so a kind of functional finance approach, uh, would then be able to shift employment to the uh, upper upper uh, uh, part of this stable inflation rate band. Um, 
and uh, tax and social policies um, should reduce inequality and support in particular lower income households in carrying the burden of rising uh, energy uh, imported energy prices. So that is, in a nutshell, the attempt at presenting a post-Keynesian alternative policy approach to what has happened and what has been applied uh, in the recent uh, years. So let me uh, take two minutes for conclusion. Um, so I would like to conclude by saying that uh, by now, I think there's broad agreement in post-Keynesian economics that uh, the essence of inflation is distribution conflict. Uh, which may have different potential triggers, as I've pointed out uh, in my introduction. In this sense, uh, inflation is always and everywhere a conflict phenomenon. And then we can distinguish uh, different triggers, as uh, I've already explained in the introduction. I think there's also broad agreement that uh, wage inflation, uh, but also wage disinflation, is usually incompletely passed through to uh, price inflation or price disinflation, and that therefore normal wage bargaining has um, not only inflation but also distribution effects. There are a few examples, including uh, some of my uh, own earlier work, but also Lavoie and others whom you see here. But the target of this work was rather on uh, other issues uh, with a new consensus macroeconomics and the underlying Nairu. Um, it, uh, uh, I would still say that uh, um, those authors which you see here uh, now believe that uh, we should build models in which we have both distribution and inflation effects of wage bargaining and of distribution conflict. There's also, I hope, broad uh, agreement on the policy responses, uh, which I've tried to outline on my, in my last figure, meaning that uh, we should uh, moderate distribution conflict by means of incomes policies, um, uh, aligning wage share targets of workers and firms. This should be complemented by low interest rate policies uh, of uh, central banks, uh, by functional finance fiscal policies, and by uh, redistribution policies in particular when it comes to uh, disposable income. Um, and all of that would have to be coordinated internationally. Mm -hmm. There are different views on the role of inflation expectations uh, for wage inflation. So we have these uh, adaptive expectations versus no or incomplete indexation views. And we have different views on stable uh, price Phillips curve and the, uh, and, and the existence of an inflation barrier, which, and I have to stress that in my or our approach is always endogenous and unstable. A way uh, around that or a way to deal uh, with that is probably to deal uh, to talk about or um, to assess different uh, inflation regimes as already uh, in Rothorn and there's recent work by Bastian Setterfield or by Schaul et al who have applied uh, such um, uh, an approach. The model presentation uh, in the very simple uh, didactic models which I've presented here have relied on profit squeeze distribution curves and on wage led demand and employment regimes. Uh, but of course, the overall framework is, is, is open for analyzing wage squeeze distribution and also profit led demand uh, and employment curves, uh, which would give to rise to uh, further um, uh, cases. I think uh, um, an area which probably needs a bit more uh, discussion and debate is the way we are modeling uh, the external sector and in particular the real exchange rate whether we take uh, the real exchange rate to be uh, exogenous whether we take it to be endogenous uh, with respect to domestic inflation or whether we uh, uh, include some real exchange rate targeting uh, uh, um, um, uh, policies into the models. Of course, uh, what I've presented here is an aggregate model, uh, which has its severe limits when it comes to dealing with energy or commodity price shocks. Uh, uh, sectoral models would be uh, much better. Uh, Caldo had already uh, pointed out to that. And recently there is a nice paper by Wildauer and others who have a sectoral uh, model uh, dealing with that, but only for the closed economy. Finally, um, just to come back to my initial uh, uh, question, so how can, uh, or can post Keynesian models generate what we observe? Yes, they can. Uh, and there may be several reasons why we have the correlation of rising inflation and rising profit shares. We may have a rising ratio of material to wage costs. 
uh, as we've shown, we may have rising markups as, uh, as I've shown. And on top of that, we may have changes in the firm and sector composition or uh, in models in which we have uh, target rate of return pricing. Uh, we may also have uh, effects of unit overhead labor uh, and uh, fixed cost digression in an economic expansion. Okay, that's it from my side. Allow me a bit of uh, advertisement at the end. So you, uh, the paper can be downloaded. It's published as an IPE working paper. Uh, a revised version will go into the issue two of the European Journal of Economics and Economic Policies, which is now uh, open access. So please look into it and submit your very good papers to our journal. And if you want to read more about uh, post-Keynesian macro models with conflict inflation, and in particular, about the post Keynesian coordinated macroeconomic policy mix, which I um, uh, propose and suggest chapter five and six of my uh, book are a bit more in detail on that. Many thanks and apologies for going a few minutes uh, over the agreed time. Thank you very much, Eckert. If you want to stop sharing. Yeah, I tried to do that. Uh, Where do I stop sharing? I, have, I think oh, at the bottom of the screen. Now I have, uh, let's see. Oop. While he's figuring that out. Okay. Thank you okay. Very Good. Much. Uh, I will now introduce uh, um, Silvio Capes. He is an assistant professor of macroeconomics at the Federal University of Alagoas in Brazil. He is associate editor of the Review of Political Economy. He's also a co-editor of the Elgar series on central banking and monetary policy um, that he co-edits with me and Guillaume Vallet. And he is the co-director of the Modern uh, Monetary Policy um, Institute. Um, so he will introduce our, uh, our next guest and he will um, deal with the questions from the audience after. Thank you, Professor. I uh, will briefly introduce Professor Kelton here. So Stephanie Kelton is a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. She is a leading expert on modern monetary theory and former chief economist on the US Senate Budget Committee on the Democratic staff. She's a regular commentator on radio and broadcast television. And her book, The Deficit Myth, is a New York Times bestseller. Professor Kelton, it is a pleasure to be talking to you today. I forward they stay for you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I am mindful of the time, and I know that uh, you and Louis Philippe are also uh, hoping, I think, to get some engagement with participants. So I'm just going to be very brief. Um, it's it was a terrific paper. I I love that we have, in a sense, the opportunity that the inflationary environment has presented. Uh, to pull forth the kind of research that post-Keynesians and other kind of heterodox economists have been doing for so long, because, you know, we really did have a very long period where there just wasn't a whole lot of interest in inflation, right? I mean, uh, to the extent that we were worried at all among most of the advanced economies anyway, uh, people were scratching their heads and trying to figure out where inflation had gone, why it was dormant for such a long period of time. And I think, you know, post Keynesians would probably by and large uh, look to the kinds of uh, explanations that Eckhart just gave us that, you know, to the extent that uh, inflation is always and everywhere a conflict phenomenon that um, the class conflict essentially just abated with um, the demise of worker unions and bargaining power across so much of the world. So, you know, mm -hmm. others told all kinds of different stories about why inflation uh, had largely disappeared, globalization and all the rest of it. But this really does allow us, I think, to enter the current debate and offer both a different way of thinking about the sources and drivers of inflation, sort of the diagnostic side, and also the prescription. Uh, I'm sorry? 
and, and I was saying, and also the prescriptive side. Uh, and, and so I like that Eckhart's really forcing us to think hard. And it really takes me back because, you know, this isn't literature that I've been steeped in. That's an understatement for a, a long period of time. But I did study at Cambridge and I did take a year long course with uh, Bob Rothorn. It was co-taught co with Haijun Chang. So I remember some of this from nearly 30 years ago. And then I was at the New School. And so a lot of this is very familiar because I took courses from people like Ed Nell and Lance Taylor. So it's all kind of somewhere uh, in in my training. I've you know moved in a, a different direction myself as an economist, and and I guess more into the prescriptive uh, thinking about you know how to respond to inflationary pressures, debates over you know things like QE, which most economists, uh, I think, believe that that was uh, the accelerator. It, if central banks would just dial up what they perceived to be monetary stimulus, that this was going to be the pathway out of, you know, low inflation or deflationary pressures, whether it was in Japan or other parts of the world. And, you know, we get to run these kind of experiments where we can watch central banks engaging in these large scale asset purchases, zero interest rate policies and that sort of thing. And having those policies not generate the kinds of, you know, the outcomes that were desired. And nobody really seemed to rethink things, you know? Uh, and here were post Keynesians and other heterodox economists, I think, uh, with a very different view of inflation dynamics and were much more critical of uh, what central banks were doing and could articulate why, you know, from an operational standpoint, the the policies weren't going to have the intended impacts. And we were, you know, I think largely ignored. And, uh, and now here we are with central banks essentially running the opposite policies, you know, raising interest rates and quantitative tightening and all the rest of it. We see inflation uh, coming down and somehow we're all supposed to believe that, you know, if you turn the dial in the other direction, it works. It just didn't work before, but now we're supposed to give central banks loads of credit for uh, bringing inflation back down. So I just uh, think there's so much more that we could all uh, say if we had more time. But I just want to say uh, that I appreciate that uh, people like Eckhart are challenging us to to recenter the role of distribution and conflict uh, in in the way that we think about inflation dynamics, and I think it's important. Thank you, Professor uh, Kelton. Uh, Professor Hein, do you want to catch up with the comments? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can just support what 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 Stephanie ha has said. I mean. Um, we need to explain uh, low inflation or even uh, uh, deflationary tendencies in terms of distribution conflict. Uh, and we've seen that in the past. I mean, uh, we have seen uh, uh, the weakening of, we have seen globalization, we, we've seen the weakening of, 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 uh, of, of labor, um, um, the, uh, the labor movement, uh, the bargaining power of workers uh, through Basically, these two processes, so globalization plus the uh, liberal or neoliberal policies being implemented uh, in many countries, uh, to different degrees, of course, uh, and that has uh, contributed to uh, the area of, of, of moderation, so the, the low inflation area. But still, um, if, if we now have these external shocks, um, um, uh, we may still uh, see at least temporarily, and the inflationary uh, process has not escalated, inflation has come down again, uh, we may see this inflation, uh, which is now um, uh, triggered not by, by workers' claims or by, by uh, uh, weak uh, trade unions now being able to claim more, but is triggered by, in this case, the claim of uh, at least four countries which uh, have a huge uh, energy import uh, uh, bill to pay uh, by the claim of the foreign sector. Or if you have the energy producing uh, 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 corporations firms in your country by the claims of this sector uh, on uh, total output and, and on real income. 
Uh, and that may then trigger a, a process of this uh, accelerating inflation, um, um, which, uh, and this I think is also needs to be explained, which has then uh, calmed down. Uh, in particular, I would argue, uh, first of all, because workers were so weak that they only got partial compensations uh, for this uh, increase uh, in prices. Uh, so that's why we've seen the fall in the in the wage share and workers were not able to fully compensate for that. Um, and partially also to some other endogeneity mechanisms, which I've, I've just mentioned. And in my view, this uh, the persistence of this inflation is then in a sense uh, being generated uh, on the one hand, of course, by powerful firms raising markups, but on the other hand, uh, also by uh, a dysfunctional uh, economic policy approach, uh, uh, raising other costs of firms as well, uh, raising uh, uh, interest costs of firms. So, um, and that is, I think, the what we should what we should look at. Uh, and uh, the presentation just wanted to give you some ideas how to do so. I know many, in particular, younger scholars, uh, scholars uh, and colleagues are, are working with uh, far more elaborated models on that. But I think that is uh, the way to go. So that's the uh, the way to look at the phenomena uh, uh, which we see. Um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it here and leave the rest for uh, for the audience to comment or to discuss. Thank you, Professor. We are now open to questions from the broader audience. You can either write your question using the chat or you can raise your hand and then I, I will hand it over to each one who raised their hands. Raise the hands. Uh, for those that are not used to Zoom, you can raise the hand by going to the reactions options in the below menu and by clicking there, you will see the raise hand option. And that's how we will be delivering the questions here. Professor Lifli Pochon has a question. Ilhan Dogus also has a question. Uh, Professor Hoshon, do you want to go first? I've only been doing Zoom for three years and I forgot to unmute. Uh, thank you very much, Eckert. Um, I don't know if you remember, but uh, we were having dinner in Berlin at uh, Natalie Marin's and um, uh, Ricardo Suma's house. And I remember I've been struggling a lot, struggling a lot with this issue of inflation for a few years. And I remember you you said at that dinner, well, inflation is always a conflict phenomenon. And that line just stuck with me. And all of a sudden, a lot of things got resolved in my mind. So uh, I really want to thank you for that. And uh, I'm really happy to see this paper. Um, but I do have a quick uh, quick. Mm, Quick uh, question, and you mentioned the different triggers of inflation, and I really like that because it shifts the bur it shifts the the blame of inflation away from always seeing workers as demanding more. Um, quick question: Could you not see if you have some sort of Gibson's paradox thing going on? Could you not see the central bank as being a trigger uh, to inflation as well? We proceed to recollect, or do I just respond? As you see fit, Professor, do you want to reply first? Uh, yeah, my, my quick answer is yes, and that is exactly what what is the um, is the uh, uh, third figure in my sequence of events where we have an increase in interest rates, uh, which further shifts up uh, this unexpected Phillips curve. So, at any rate of employment, you get even another inflationary push through this channel. I mean, the question is uh, how strong this effect is, but uh, I think lots of empirical research uh, tells us, even central bank research uh, tells us that that there is an effect uh, on uh, on this uh, cost, um, interest cost channel, um, or what you call the Gibson paradox. So it is there, it's there. So, and it is, uh, it is, and I've, I've written about that, I think already, and that was the focus of my 2006 paper, as I remember. Uh, where I was not so much interested in this uh, distribution effect between capital and labor and rather assumed that uh, there is a full pass through of uh, increases in uh, unit labor cost uh, to prices, but I was interested more in this uh, interest cost channel and, and, and show that if you take this into account, uh, into account that what uh, in the mainstream approach is called the narrow, uh, this narrow becomes endogenous to central bank policies through this channel. 
Thank you, Professor. Ilan Dogus has a question. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Oh, it's okay. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Eckert, for your presentation. I have two small questions, very quickly. One, your model was a macro model, uh, but I want to know, um, do you talk about term level when you talk about weight shed target or at nation level? Because I think unless the bargaining process takes place at nation level, workers cannot target a weight shed. Uh, and we don't know the inflation in advance. That's why I'm a bit skeptical about this uh, way of reasoning that workers target the wage share at nation level, if especially the bargaining process takes place at firm level or sector level. Uh, second, uh, do we know any uh, case where high inflation is caused by demand? Uh, I searched about it, but I didn't find any. Uh, and according to the Economic Policy Institute, the contribution of wages to inflation before the pandemic was 62% and inflation was very low. But the contribution of wages to, uh, in, uh, to inflation after post-pandemic, it was 8%. That's why I don't see any reason dampening the demand, even if the demand driven inflation because wages can contribute only to low level of inflation because wages can spur productivity and so on. But profit and input prices not. Uh, that's why uh, do we see any reason for uh, uh, demand suppressing policies even if inflation is demand driven? Thank you. I'm not sure whether I understood the last part of the question because the connection seemed to be interrupted a bit. Uh, but uh, let me first address the first part or the first question. Um, I mean, the model is a simple textbook uh, uh, one good model. It's at least the way I presented it here. But of course, uh, it can uh, uh, reflect and incorporate um, um, since it has uh, included, uh, and that is one channel through which wage bargaining can have an impact on income distribution, since it includes uh, imported uh, raw materials, imported uh, energy, uh, through this channel, you can, even with a constant markup, you can have effects um, on uh, income distribution. Um, and if you now would disaggregate the model, uh, and that is the argument which I've briefly um, pointed out in relationship with the work by uh, Sulus Mabini. Um, so if you disaggregate the model and and uh, uh, have some some real world contents to that and, and just assume that the firm sector is not not uh, homogeneous. Um, or you may also argue that uh, firms are not facing the same normal wage increases because you have um, you don't have a, a national level of wage bargaining, but you may have firm level wage bargaining, uh, then uh, you may have that uh, uh, when you have powerful workers, uh, something which we haven't had for a long, long time, but go back, let's say, to the 1970s, and when we have, or the 1960s, late 60s, 1970s, when you have powerful workers, you may have that uh, they drive up um, uh, wages and only part of the firms uh, are fully uh, uh, able to pass yeah. this through, and therefore you may see a squeeze of the markup and uh, also uh, a fall uh, of the profit share and the rise of the wage share. I think so. This may happen, and uh, there are historical periods in which this has happened um, uh, some long time ago. Um, so, this is the first question. The second question regarding the demand led inflation. So, maybe the, let me just give a general answer to that uh, question. It will only lead to inflation if there is some resistance in the system. So that is already what Calgo had pointed out. Uh, because what happens if um, a demand is rising, uh, well, in the, in the usual textbook Kolecki model, there is no effect on prices. But let's assume there is an effect on prices, either through uh, bottlenecks or through uh, the uh, imported um, uh, uh, or, or through the uh, um, uh, primary sector, which also is a is, is then uh, uh, the demand for which is also then rising, and you see an increase in prices there. 
Uh, now, this will only lead to inflation if uh, there is some resistance, if workers, for instance, don't want to have a lower wage share or don't want to have a lower real wage rate if you uh, take productivity growth uh, uh, to be zero and productivity to, uh, to be constant. So, in other words, uh, in the way, and that was part of the uh, uh, Caldwell Robinson Marvin uh, approach, which I showed here, uh, if a demand affects uh, the uh, um, profit share claim uh, claims of the firm so leads to a higher target profit share a lower target wage share through the increase in prices relative to normal wages if workers accept that then you just see a one-off increase in the price level but you don't see inflation so you just see a, a change of the price level relative to normal wages or relative to uh, normal unit labor cost if you want to include uh, productivity into into the argument but you don't see inflation. So in other words, um, a demand uh, a layer inflation is also conflict inflation, uh, or if demand, an increase in demand leads to inflation, um, it can only do so through the conflicting claims channel, meaning that claims of the firms are rising, workers are resisting, or some other uh, sectors are resisting, and then uh, you get the inflationary process. Thank you, Professor. Uh, the next question is by Professor Satterfield. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Eckhard. That was that was masterful. There was uh, uh, there's a lot we could talk about, so I'm gonna sort of ruthlessly uh, self-edit here and we can catch up at the summer school. Uh, and by the way, thanks Stephanie as well for your contextualizing comments and just uh, emphasizing, I think what uh, Eckhard was talking about towards the end of his discussion, which is trying to bring the theory uh, into reality. So um, I'll just ask one question, which I think is a follow-up perhaps on what you've just said. Uh, your theme at beginning and end was that inflation is always and everywhere a conflict. Uh, uh, story. And I was just wondering how our uh, friend and colleague Tom Pally would react to that. I'm fairly sure that he'd start talking about his Tobin-esque uh, escalator model. And I'm just thinking about that because, you know, in principle, it, it is analytically different. It's not a one-sector model, it's a multi-sector model, and it depends on local bottlenecks uh, that then create a kind of gradual run up in, in aggregate inflation. So to bring this to a point, um, do you think that here there is a, a, an even bigger synthesis of post-Keynesian inflations that would include that type of mechanism in a multi-sector context as something that is qualitatively different but possible? Or does this just lead us back to the answer to your previous question that it really is all disguised conflict after all? Well, I mean, it, you, it's, it's it's not. I mean, in the in the aggregate, it's conflict between these those four sectors or, or or groups of actors. I would argue, but of course, you have also conflict between firms, right? I mean, you have uh, uh, input output relationships, uh, and you may have conflict between workers uh, as well. I mean, they may uh, uh, you may have this wage wage um, uh, uh, price inflation. So. Uh, the question is, I mean, uh, and that is, um, maybe it's it's very simple, and uh, uh, it's a very simple idea, uh, which I think has been there since uh, at least Caldor, uh, maybe maybe earlier, uh, that uh, inflation as a permanent process will only arise if the change in relative prices um, is not accepted. If one sector or one group of actors or even one firm is raising prices, and if this is not accepted by others, then uh, you have the process being started. And that is the point I wanted to make. And of course, you can disaggregate that. And then you have exactly, I think, what Tom has had in mind. Thank you, Professor. The last raised hand we have here is by Eto de Gallo. Oh, we have another one after him. So, add to the please your question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Eckhart. I also uh, like very much the, the the last remarks on uh, you know post Keynesian models trying to match reality. And uh, you have a question on on, on that. You know, I, I, well, from what we see in the empirical literature, uh, I'm thinking of Alvarez at Ali IMF working paper, there is 
really no evidence whatsoever or no strong evidence, let's say, of, of, of the relevance of the wage price spirals in high income uh, countries. And I think the same would apply to any idea, to any empirical relevance of a profit price spiral. So my question, my kind of provocative question in this sense would be, you know, what's the rel what 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 does the, the inflation barrier conceived as an endogenous and unstable process uh, tell us uh, about you know inflation uh, in uh, in in high income economies? Um, and I'm saying this because from you know what what I imagine, what I what I what I what I from what I understand, the inflation barrier essentially says that you know an initial increase in money wages or in uh, nominal profits leads to further increases. But you know, do we really need the 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 process to be unstable? Could the the the, the this rise, you know, kind of the second derivative of the process being negative, so the process becomes uh, becomes stable over time? Because you know, I think this would be more empirically relevant in a way. Thanks. Uh, yes, I agree with what you say. I mean, uh, and if you look at the companion paper, you will exactly see this. Um, so if you play with uh, the, the, the precise way we are modeling it, um, you may see uh, also in uh, this uh, 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 initial, uh, starting with an inflation barrier, you may see that uh, with uh, different assumptions about pass through, you may then uh, end up with flat uh, Phillips curve, uh, etc. I mean, you will see uh, the what I what I presented here, and and that's why I'm not did not present a full model on that. Uh, uh, you will see, of course, inflation or even rising inflation uh, initially. So that's how it starts, uh, if claims change. But the question is where it ends depends a bit on how exactly we model it. Uh, so how are we modeling the um, uh, um, the wage inflation, the uh, wage and price inflation uh, uh, equations? And if you look into that paper, we have I think at the end we have eight models, so four variations of what I call the Black Lavoie Setterfield approach and four variations of this uh, Heinz Dockhammer approach, and you will see very different results. You can see very different results. Um, so in other words. Um, for me, uh, this is just the way I start thinking about it. I start thinking about it starting with Robinson's idea or Caldo's and Robinson's ideas of, of inflation as, as being generated by distribution conflict. And then uh, the final outcome uh, will uh, very much depend on, uh, first of all, um, uh, the way uh, you uh, set up your, your claims Right, uh, whether claims are whether workers' claims are really rising uh, in employment or whether workers' claims are flat in employment, and that may be due to two reasons. One reason may be workers are weak. The other reason may be workers have some insights. Uh, trade unions have some insights in, in in macroeconomic feedbacks, and they are able to incorporate that into wage bargaining. So claims maybe maybe flat. So that may be one reason why. Uh, you don't see this uh, 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 cumulative dis, uh, uh, unstable process. And then the question is, uh, how exactly are you modeling the behavior uh, when claims diverge? So how exactly do you model uh, the wage inflation and the price inflation um, curve? And what I've shown here is one just one extreme version of modeling it, which generates this, this unstable process. But uh, if you look at the other paper, you will see that starting from my, well, Engelbert's and my approach, you can also get a flat Phillips curves, although you start initially uh, with diverging targets, um, just because of incomplete pass-through, incomplete indexation, incomplete, uh, uh, um, 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 yeah, responses to each other. So yeah, I, I agree. And uh, what I've presented here, as I said, is just a way of thinking about it, an initial way of thinking about it and putting conflict um, in the focus. Um, but it does not claim to present the only uh, medium to long run outcome of it. Thank you, Professor. We are now proceeding to the last three questions. We apologize for that, but we are getting time constrained. So it will be Shahin and then Mari and then Gennaro. So, Shahin, you can ask your question. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. No, you, you pronounce it 
like a native. So thank you very much uh, for, for the presentation and for holding the session, uh, just to make it brief so I don't uh, mention the names. Uh, but uh, I have um, two questions. Uh, one is about uh, how do we validate such method? Uh, how do we know that this method actually is explaining reality better than um, mainstream methods and approaches, etc.? And the second thing is, um, well, in this scenario, I mean, is it possible to look at this scenario from the perspective of com the conflict? And the scenario is when the demand is on average decreasing, but the prices are increasing in a uh, economy that is uh, that is, is basically is full of monopolies. Let's say, okay, and there are few firms that they have a very uh, very significant market power. So um, I understand the cases like when we have uh, workers from one side and employers from the other side. In, in the in this scenario, uh, there is uh, no like an active member. But uh, still, uh, we can have a persistent inflation. And basically, I'm talking about my, uh, my homeland, Iran. So thank you very much. OK, so how do we, do we uh, evaluate that or validate that? I mean, uh, well, <laughs> there's uh, the euro ways. I mean, we can estimate wage and price inflation uh, equations, uh, and uh, but we can also just look at final outcomes, uh, controlling for other effects uh, of uh, um, of uh, uh, what we have observed. I mean, uh, that is uh, how uh, several people have been doing that. Uh, I'm not sure whether I understood the last question. Um, I mean, the model is based on the idea that we have price setting power of firms. So um, uh, oligopolies, uh, monopolist, mono, monopolistic competition. Uh, so it's based on this idea that there is uh, uh, price setting power, of course, constrained price setting power uh, of firms, and that workers have also a bargaining power over uh, the uh, normal wage rate, at least. And it's, it's, so to speak, a, uh, a power game, which we are modeling here. Thank Thanks. you, Professor. Uh, the penultimate question by Professor Mario Secadeccia. Um, uh, thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I want to congratulate uh, Ricard. I mean, he did a wonderful job and really quite comprehensive in terms of the uh, the literature and the uh, and the various approaches and uh, i you know I, I have absolutely no problem at that level uh however you you yourself said it and indeed uh, it's been said before right now it's an aggregate model you know what, what you're doing there is and, and and it is important to recognize the sectoral or you know when is the disaggregator uh, labini whoever uh, approaches here uh now, if you look at it historically in terms of inflation phenomena, whether it be like in the 1970s or, or during the world wars or you know, German hyperinflation or whatever, uh, we, we do have a, a, yeah, different kind of mechanisms at work sometimes that are uh, at play because of the sectoral differences across mm -hmm. you know, the economy. And what I would like to ask you basically is if we look at the current or recent inflation that we've been having right now, you know, if you take like the Kaletsky is, division is a good example of a simple one where you have the cost versus demand determined pricing and all that, uh, uh, or could, whatever it is. I mean, what I'd like to ask you is what would be a more appropriate understanding of what has been happening in the last while? Because there are sectors of the economy where prices have haven't changed much at all, even, you know, or, or is even falling in some cases. There are other sectors which have grown slowly. Others have grown a lot. I mean, but what would be the appropriate kind of division, if you want to call it that, you know, in understanding what has been happening during this round of inflation? Uh, well, I can only refer to the the paper by uh, Rafael Wildauer with uh, three young co-authors, and they have a three-sector model, and uh, but without an external sector. So um, it is it is more, I think, um, 
designed uh, for the US than it than for some European country or my country in which uh, lots of energy is being imported uh, and they have a three sector model so and I think this already allows them uh, to show a lot more than of course I can show with an aggregate model which as I said only has this uh, didactic purpose to show that how conflict comes in and, uh, and but I, I think you can already explain a bit with that but but for sure I would at least go for this three sector model as as they do Thank you, Professor. So, last question by Professor Gennaro Zeza. Thank you. I want to thank Louis Philippe for organizing this and Eckhart for the presentation. I have a, a short, complicated question for Eckhart, which is uh, what changes do you think would be needed, if any, to adapt the model to high inflation countries like South America? So, my view is that uh, I entirely agree with you that inflation is a conflict, conflict phenomenon, and the central bank is usually in developed countries very influential on who is going to win the conflict. Usually, uh, it's not the workers. Now, in South America, uh, some countries are looking for dollarization as the solution for ending inflation. And my suspicion is that this, again, is a solution which uh, may not have the workers as the winners. So my question is, why do people vote for governments who want this as a solution for high inflation? Thank you. Uh, well, I could now argue, and I do argue, I'm an economist and I'm not a political scientist, so I can't tell you why they're voting this way. I mean, but I agree that, uh, I mean, as, the way I would in, interpret the policy, policy choice is just to uh, cut off this uh, imported uh, inflation uh, or this depreciation imported inflation channel. I think you agree on that. Um, and, uh, well, of course, it it, it is... Uh, not uh, in favor of, of, of workers, uh, not in favor of low income classes, because you have uh, not only the, the, the distribution effect, but you also have the aggregate demand effect. Uh, but why uh, these um, uh, these political parties, or in, in many cases only individuals, uh, so, so these populists are, are getting public support? I mean, well, I mean, my, 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 my guess would be that people are fed up with uh, uh, ever rising inflation and having their, their, their income being um, devalued on a, on a regular basis. And uh, there is probably no uh, convincing um, policy approach from the progressive or the left side. So, um, yeah, but but I can only guess. I mean, I'm not an expert on that, and I, I, I to be frank, I cannot really answer your question. But I guess you did not expect me to answer it satisfactorily. Thank you, Professor. We are now closing our our webinar, so I want to thank uh, Professor Eckhart. Eckhard Hai and Professor Stephanie Kelton for their presentations and comments and thank everybody who participated and for the questions. I apologize for not taking any further questions, but we are now time constrained. A couple of things to, to close here. Uh, the Review of Political Economy is publishing a symposium on conflict inflation. It will be on the October 2024 issue. Uh, the Monetary Policy Institute her, has more books coming out this year on gender instability, monetary policy implementation, and also a book on dollarization. So thank you, Professor Genado Zeza, for mentioning dollarization. We will have a book uh, later this year coming out. Uh, our blog has weekly updates, so stay tuned there. And the next workshop we're going to have is on February 8th with Joseph Stiglitz and Claudia Sen on inflation, monetary policy, and team transitory. So stay tuned on social media to the Monetary Policy Institute. We will be sending all the information there. And that's it. Thank you all very much for, for participating. And, and also thanks for Professor Rochon for organizing this. See you in, in a few weeks on our next webinar. Thank you.